How y'all doing today? Oh, come on now, y'all can do better than that. How y'all doing today? That's what I'm talking about. We'll pull this up here and I can get started. So, because I'm from University of California and I'm an engineering dean, I'd like to begin this talk with a test. You got two lines there, the red line and the blue line. All I'm asking you to do is to tell me which one is longer. Okay, we'll do this by a show of hands. How many of you believe the red line is longer? How many of you believe the blue line is longer? And how many of you believe the two lines are actually the same size? Okay, so we had some that said it was longer, the red was longer, some said the blue was longer. Most said the two were the same size. Well, actually, the red one's longer. Now, now, some of you, it's your first time seeing this and you're actually looking at it. Some of you, many, many of the adults in this room have seen this test before. And in the test, it always comes out that the two are the same size, except today. The two are not the same size because I changed it. I literally changed the test. I made the red one longer. I could have made the blue one longer. What in the world does that have to do with anything you're gonna to learn today? Well, the deal is this. The world you live in, the world you exist in every day, the things you see around you are changing so rapidly that the world is not as you think it is. And so, so let me explain that in a little more detail. You see, you may not know this, but we live in a world of unprecedented challenges. There are about seven billion people on the planet today. We know that over the next 10 years, we're gonna add a billion more. Why is that important? If I start from the history of time and work all the way up to the year 1990, we had five billion people. And then from, well, from, from 1990 until today, we've added two billion more, we'll add another billion more in 10 years. The number of people on the planet is accelerating. And as the number of people on the planet accelerates, they create all kinds of problems for everybody here. Here are a whole host of them. I live down in Southern California. We haven't had a meaningful rain in Southern California in the last three months. We've rarely had any rain at all, but not a meaningful one, where you go out and you can actually feel the raindrops. That's not normal, even for Southern California. You all heard the song, right? It never rains in Southern California. It, it actually isn't raining in Southern California. <laughs> but here are the host of challenges. This picture right here shows our reservoir, our most important reservoir in the Southwest, Lake Mead. And you see this line? This is where the water line is supposed to be. This is where it is today. There is a real chance that in your lifetime, freshwater scarcity will be a real issue. So we're solving that at UC Irvine. You know what we're doing? We're taking the water out the toilet and re-putting it into the sink. <laughs> That's what's happening. Oh, it'll happen in your city too. Because it's not, you're not getting much rain in Northern California these days either, are you? The water has to come from somewhere. Don't worry, we clean it. <laughs> It'll cost $3.3 trillion to rebuild our infrastructure in this country. $3.3 trillion. Every year, the American Society of Civil Engineers does a report card for the country. 
And what that report card tells us is how good the bridges, the roads, the dams, the aqueducts, the airports, the levees. Every year it gets a grade. The state of California this year, uh, this past year got a D minus. In fact, about one out of every three bridges and overpasses in the state of California are what we call structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. Now I know you say, well, I'm in eighth grade, what does that mean? That means they can't carry the loads in which they were designed to carry. So as you drive home, as you guys ride back home, and you count, you go over across a bridge and an overpass, about one out of every three are not built to hold the weight. So just count them out. One, two, three, can this be the one? One, two, three, can that one be the one? You have unprecedented challenges from all over the globe. When you graduate from school, you will not be competing against students who graduated from school. And uh, if, you go, if you go to college, you go to UC Irvine, you're not just competing against the kids from UCLA, against the students from uh, USC and MIT. You're going to be competing against students from all over the world. And all over the world now, students are becoming much smarter. It used to be that all of the technology, the majority of the innovation resided in our country. But that's no longer the case. Innovation resides everywhere. This is what Singapore looked like in 1965. That's what Singapore looks like today. That picture was taken from the same point. That's Singapore in 1965. That's Singapore today. Why am I telling you this? Because right now, there's a kid in Asia sitting by candlelight, studying hard to get what they feel you already have. Ooh, okay. I'm going to come over here. I was getting some hard looks over there. Those kids by many exams, many tests, fare much better than our kids on the same exams and questions. They can't tell you what the latest song is, but they're studying mathematics and physics and chemistry. Why? Because they want what you have. Okay, we keep going. Another thing we like to do is look at years to 50 million users. That tells us how fast things are changing. So it took radio 38 years, television 13, cell phone 7, internet 4, Facebook 2. Anybody here got a Facebook account? It's all right, you can raise your hands. Anybody, any of y'all have Facebook accounts? Y'all not supposed to. <laughs> but it took Facebook two years. Facebook has 1.4 billion monthly active users right now. And what does that mean? Why is that important? More than half of the top 10 in-demand jobs in 2014 did not even exist in 2004. So that's how fast your world is changing. So, and, and so now why am I telling you all of this? Because it is extremely important for you to make the connection between what engineers do and the life that you will live what computer scientists do, and the life that you will live, the impact that we will have moving forward. There are also tremendous opportunities out there. Up at the top, the woman that's speaking, uh, we call her Emily. There's nothing about Emily that's real. Emily's totally computer generated. Emily is totally computer generated. Okay, now you're starting to see. You see, in the next five years, you'll watch your first full-length movie and none of the characters will be real and you won't know the difference. They'll look just like you and I. Oh, and by the way, you don't have to worry about those characters causing any problems. They're not going to go shoplifting. They're not going to take a twig off a branch and beat their kid. They're not gonna <laughs> you're not going to have any of those problems because they'll all be computer generated. That's happening.
You see, this past year, well, actually in 2013, computers eclipsed humans in computational capacity, meaning the average computer can be programmed uh, to now think, to now communicate. How many of you have a smartphone? Do you have a smartphone? How many of you can communicate with your smartphone? Can talk to your smartphone and have your smartphone talk back to you? That technology is continuing to get better and better and better. And very soon, not only will your phone be able to talk back to you, but your phone will be able to what we call contextualize, meaning that it'll start to actually think for you. It'll recognize in your to-do list that, oh, I need a new hammer. And when you ride past a Home Depot, it'll tell you to go over to the Home Depot and buy a hammer. It'll be connected to your human genome. And so when you go to McDonald's to have a hamburger, it'll say, you know, you probably shouldn't have that hamburger today because you have the propensity to have heart disease later on and maybe you should get the fruit cup. How many of y'all want the fruit cup? Fruit cup? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So in the next five years, you'll no longer need any of these things. IDs, money, credit cards, store cards, business cards, photos. Actually, you don't need many of these now. You don't need, you don't need an ID now. I have an iPhone 5, 5S. Right? And I can access my phone by my thumbprint. And once I can access my phone by my thumbprint, my phone knows that it's me. Right? If my phone knows that it's me, when I go into a store, the, the computer systems in that store recognize my phone. They know I'm there. Why do I need to have an ID or a credit card? It's actually better than an ID and a credit card. Right? Even if somebody steals my phone, they don't have my thumbprint, unless they steal my phone and my hand. <laughs> How many of you have seen Google Glass? See by show of hands. Do you know very, very soon what we're working on at the universities is that you'll actually be educated by Google Glass. You'll wear these glasses, and instead of having to go to class, the class will actually come to you. You'll be able to take that class. You like that? You'll be able to take that class wherever that class is. Right? The class can be held in the morning at 6 o'clock, and you can say, well, I don't want to take it at 6 in the morning. I don't want to take it at 3 in the afternoon. Uh, I want to take the class at 10 p.m. So at home at 10 p.m. when you're ready, you just download the actual lecture for that class and you'll take the lecture of that class that day. What if I told you that students are already doing that now? Students at colleges and universities at some institutions are already doing this. Did you know that Amazon was developing these things called drones to deliver your packages? That's real. That will happen. Your packages will not be delivered by some person in the future. They could be very well delivered by a drone. And people said, oh, that's just a game. There's no way that can happen. Actually, every major delivery company, FedEx, UPS, we're working with a number. We had a very good drone program at UCI. They're all working on drones for delivery. Drones will happen. You will be, your packages will be delivered by some little thing that flies and just drops them and then takes off. Right now, you ever heard of organ donors? Well, organ donors may be a thing of the past by the time you become adults. Why, why would an organ donor be a thing of the past? Because we're actually using this technology called 3D printing to print organs. We're working on an artificial pancreas at UCI. There are other groups working on artificial livers, artificial uh, lungs, 
uh, all types of artificial components. What's the point in all of this? The point in all of this is, this is what engineers and computer scientists of the future will be doing. And this is why it's so important for all of you to make this connection. Now, go to the next slide. Let's talk a little bit about what engineers and scientists do. But before that, I want to dispel a couple of myths, and I'm going to use myself as an example. I'm a mechanical engineer. I received my PhD in mechanical engineering. One of the biggest myths that I will dispel to you is that you have to love math in order to be an engineer. You don't have to love math. You have to do math. Math is a part of it, but math is not a bigger part of it as people think. How many of you like to solve problems? You have issues, people around you, they come to you because they're dealing with something and they want you to help them solve it. The fundamental quality of an engineer is that they're problem solvers. How many of you in this room, adults, I want to see your show of hands, how many of you are engineers or computer scientists? See by show of hands. See by show of hands. Actually, uh, can you stand up? Stand up, I want, I want, I want the students to see it. Let's show hands. So you see all these people around the room are engineers or computer scientists, right? In your daily work right now, I want everybody in here who solves math problems in their daily work, everybody in here who solves math problems, I want you to sit down. <laughs> you still see the majority of the people standing. Because with technology today, oftentimes the computers, the technology solves a lot of, you can sit down now, sorry. <laughs> the computers, the technology solves a lot of the math problem. So don't let a fear or a worry of mathematics keep you out of engineering or keep you out of computer scientists or keep you out of chemistry or keep you out of biology because you have to know the math. Some of us struggle through the math Right? But ultimately, you have to problem solve. What do engineers do? And what do scientists do? Next. So scientists investigate what is, they discover new knowledge by peering into the unknown. That's kind of a general definition for scientists. They, scientists, sci, the, the work that scientists do is really about discovery. Next. What do engineers do? They create what, has not been. They make things that have never existed before. They make things better. That's what engineers do. There's a slight difference between the two. Next. But today, many of us do all of the same things. You'll see in a laboratory these days, you'll see a scientist and engineer, they're working side by side. You can't tell which one is which. We all work on very, very similar sets of problems. So let's talk about engineers for a second. If I give you a more technical definition, it's the application of scientific and mathematical principles to practical ends, such as the design, manufacture, and operation of efficient and economical structures, machines, processes, and systems. So you got robotic systems here. Keep going, one more. You see these, so when you think of engineers, especially a mechanical engineer, you think of all of these robotic systems. But engineering is much more than that. Next slide. Engineering is a part of everything that we do. So we've got the cars, cell phones, computers, Xbox, refrigerators, roadways, homes, skateboards. Oh, Big Mac. Really? Engineering has something to do with my Big Mac? Okay, mac and cheese. Who likes mac and cheese? Okay, I know that, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I can always get a rise out of that one. So, it's a big part of what we do in both of those areas. Do you really believe that the Big Mac is an engineered product? Yes. Okay, you don't? Well, let's give it as an example. Next slide. So, we eat about four million McDonald's hamburgers per day. 
all right? So those of you at your tables, I want you to take a look at your little paper and your pencil there. We're gonna go through some quick calculations here. So four million McDonald's hamburgers per day, okay? Each burger is about a quarter pound of beef. So how many million pounds of beef per day is that? How many? So four million burgers per day, each burger is a fourth of a pound. How many million pounds is that per day? One million. That is one million pounds of beef per day. Each cow. So we do one million pounds of beef per day. Each cow weighs 1,150 pounds. That's what a cow weighs. You know the beef comes from the cow, right? You seen, you seen the Chick-fil-A commercial? Eat more chicken? <laughs> so it's 1,150, 1,150 pounds in a cow. Now, you only eat about a third of that because the rest is bones and cartilage. You know, it actually might wind up in your hamburger, but let's hope not. <laughs> oh, you didn't know that? Okay, there it's all. So about one third of that is actual beef that we eat. That's about 760 pounds of beef. Okay? So 760 pounds per cow, a million pounds per day, so how many cows per day do we eat? 750 pounds in one cow, one million pounds of beef per day. About how many cows is that per day? I see you working. I see you, you can discuss amongst yourselves. I'll give you a, I'll give you a minute. Do we have an answer? Right here, how many? Two hundred fifty? More than that. A million pounds a day, about seven hundred and fifty pounds per cow. How many cows per day? That's right. That's right, it's more than a thousand, it's about 1,300 cows per day. Anybody get that? Anybody near that? All right, all right. So about 1,300 cows per day. And here's the last question. How many cows per year? McDonald's open on Sunday, right? Okay, how many pounds per year? How many pounds per year? Nope. 1,300? Uh, sorry, how many cows per year? 1,300 cows times, times 365 gives me what? I know you know. Well, oh, right here, in the, all the way in the back. What you got? Yeah. That's about right. 400, that's about 480,000 cows per day. Next slide. So, that Big Mac is an engineered product. Keep going. Four million. Now, in order to process that amount of cows, it takes processing facilities to process 480,000 cows per year. It also takes water, 5.2 billion gallons of water per year. How does all of that get to the cow? Cow didn't, they're just not out in the grass somewhere eating that amount of grain and grass and drinking all of that water. No, it re requires a large factory or facility organized and designed and managed 
by an engineer. Next. Next. This is the tallest building in the world. Tallest building in the world is in the United Arab Emirates in the city of Dubai. It is 2,700 feet tall. Obviously, this is built and designed by engineers. This is the largest bridge in the world, built in Japan. It's more than a mile long, 6,500 feet. Next. Not only that, engineering is lucrative. These are the top 10 jobs in society today. If you graduated with a BS degree, these are the top 10 jobs as it relates to salary earnings. And you can see almost all of them are engineering. So if you want to, no matter what major you want, the majors that make the most money tend to be in this space. I don't really like to talk about money as much because the previous speaker said it's really about loving what you do. But if money is important to you, <laughs> you, you want to be here. And also, finally, engineering is fun. See, to me, problem solving is fun. Looking at what's going to be uh, the next big thing to do in technology is fun. And we get into that. Do you want to be the person who just uses the technology, or do you want to be the person that produces it? What about producing new things for others? That's what really, really motivates me as a person. So this class is called Design, Build, Code. Design, building, and making are an integral part to what all engineers and computer scientists do. We design it. We build it, we make it. Finally, engineering is you. Oftentimes, when you look at people who look like us, the underlying thought is that we don't have a history in this space. But your history runs very, very deep. It runs longer than your time here in this country. Your history started all the way back in Africa. And if I go back to Africa and go back to its technology centers, there was a lot of technology in Africa. Moving from Southern Africa, where a lot of the technologies developed, going up through Northern Africa, and in the, where it actually became prominent and well-known. Everyone knows of the pyramids. But you always hear that the pyramids are in the Middle East. Mm, Egypt's in Africa. What they don't tell you is if you go to Egypt and you go further south, if you go into the Sudan, if you go even further south than that, there are pyramids all throughout the continent of Africa. And the pyramids in the south are older than the ones in Egypt. Not just about Egypt. We've been doing great things since you were here. Up at the top left is a guy by the name of Garrett Morgan. And what did Garrett Morgan do? <laughs> Click. Garrett Morgan invented the stoplight and the gas mask. I actually went in a fire and pulled out 33 people to show that his gas mask would work. You see, in 1913 alone, there are more than 1,000 patents issued to black people. All of this is documented. Louis Latimer. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Thomas Edison's light bulb would only last a few days. It would burn for a few days and it would burn out. Louis Latimer developed the filament that caused lights to burn hours and hours and days and months on end. The invention for Louis Latimer's filament is the basic filament that's in uh, incandescent light bulbs today. Next. Mark Hanna. The building you're in now was the former home of Silicon Graphics. A, com a company called Silicon Graphics occupied this building before this. I think that's what you told me yesterday. Is that right? Where, where, where are my museum folks here? Is that right? Silicon Graphics was founded by a guy named Jim Clark and five other people. One of them was Mark Hanna. 
the actual technology associated with Silicon Graphics, the geometric engine, was Mark Hanna's thesis project. Jim Clark was his advisor. And the very building you're sitting has a contribution of someone who looks like you. Next, Mark Dean. We've all heard of the PC, the personal computer. IBM invented the personal computer. Three of, nine, of IBM's original nine patents on the personal computer were developed by this guy, Mark Dean. Little known fact that you people don't talk about much, but it's actually realistic. And then I noticed we got a lot of group here, got a lot of y'all here from Black Girls Code, right? I couldn't do something without having my sister up here. Click. <laughs> Annie Easley. Annie Easley was a software designer, a software programmer, and developed the software that both uh, NASA and the federal government uses for energy management for many of its facilities and systems. Her software was actually used and developed and, and helped to manage all of the early space shuttle launches. What is my point? My point is, is that there is no monopoly on intelligence. There's no monopoly on science and technology. There is only what we have in here that tells us what we can and what we cannot do. I know that I am looking out at some of the next great scientists and engineers of our, of, our, of our time. I know that, I feel it personally. You are getting the right background and training for you to propel a long way. I, did, I wish I could have gotten what you're getting now when you're getting it. That doesn't come by accident. It comes because of the help and the engagement and the dedication of some really strong individuals. I want you all to give the adults, the parents, the volunteers who are all helping you out a round of applause because they deserve it. <laughs> and I'm going to leave you with this last thought. I'm going to leave you with this last thought. Look, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but it will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Continue to learn, continue to do more. You will do great things. Thank you.